I'm Tom Ray from the band Lorenzo's Music, and you're listening to the Lorenzo's Music Podcast. So this is a podcast where I wanted to go out and meet other musicians and just kind of talk with them about what they do and how they do it. One person that I met actually came to a pop-up event that I was doing late last year. I was selling some artwork and books, and he came up and asked what was going on, and as we got to talking, I found out that he's in a band here in Madison called The Fancy Pairs. I thought it would be interesting to get together with his band and kind of talk to them about what they do. So here's my interview with The Fancy Pairs. and I have been playing together for like 10 years in different various bands and stuff. And so he actually went to MMI here in town and, uh, which is now gone. Yes. Which is now gone. <laughs> and, uh, so we were recording our, we've always been doing it in like in the pottery studio back in the day, <laughs> or like down in Lake Geneva where we were before. I think you, I think you need to give some context. <laughs> yeah, I, no, I was, don't worry. I was going to interrupt. So in the pottery studio, yeah, yeah, Will's mom is like a master potter, Claire Bailey, check out her work. We all used to like gravitate around Will's house in high school. And, uh, we, we had this, like the pottery studio had a little house on it that Will kind of moved into that we could make trouble in. And, and that was kind of like the roots of all of our music scene. We had the freedom to like jam into the wee hours of the night and, you know, the neighbors didn't care and the cops didn't care. So it was pretty awesome. So we started way back then with our amps way too loud in that room and we tried live recording and then we've gone into like where we were just doing stuff in the living room when we first moved up here and we did like three albums that way <laughs> and they came they came out all right when i first met will and tim their living room was basically a studio the will's drum <laughs> set was set up in the living room the couch was full of equipment recording gear microphones the uh, first fancy pairs album living on a pair we did the drums live and then we pretty much did everything else in the box which was cool because it, you know, you have so much isolation and all that stuff, but then it added so much time onto the mixing process because like you have to make all these decisions and the guitar tones going in are, you know, you're stuck with those. And it's, so it's like, it's a little too far from what we really do, which I feel like we're kind of the type of band where it's not a ton of nuts and bolts. Like we just get together in the room, we plug in our amps and we play. So that's kind of like, we're trying to do that with this recording that we're working on now is going more to the, like the live room approach. And it's pretty cool so far because you kind of like giving yourself that set of limitations to work in of like, I'm only going to use my amp or we're only going to use these things. We're not going to do a bunch of plugins or stuff like that. For me, I've been inherently writing since an early age, like 10, 11 and I think it stemmed from not connecting with writing a diary or a journal, and it moved more into... So the lack of having one. Right. I didn't... I, I couldn't connect to that. I felt I felt like if I were to write about something my day, mm. it should be to an audience and not necessarily just me. And I don't know why. And I guess maybe... It could, That's usually the exact opposite reason. <laughs> it, 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 I think it maybe have... It probably stemmed from... Uh, my childhood really of just being surrounded by people, great storytellers. Uh, like, up, for example, what? Yeah. I grew up in uh, pretty much the middle of nowhere in a town called Carthage, Carthage North Carolina. Oh. And uh, really, it's, you know, I drove 30, 45 minutes to school every day. It was it was out in the middle of nowhere. What Are you an old man, like, uphill in the <laughs> snow? <laughs> <laughs> we did have uh, two feet of snow once, and we were shut down for two weeks. That's and awesome. one of our neighbors was driving around people around our little community in a tractor it was okay. it was pretty amazing as a kid because I didn't have to go to school but uh, you know the neighbors that we were surrounded by they were all family and they would get together and have these amazing potlucks or pig pickings and people would you know pull out all these instruments and would just be naturally talented musicians and each song had some sort of story and they'd get together at the end of the evening you know after drinking moonshine and just tell like the kids like you know just these great adventures that they had you know in the same woods that we were sitting in and experiencing it with them and I think growing up with that it's really I've attached to that I, I really enjoy that and I think that's becoming sort of a lost art form can I say I just love the fact that your entire like history sounds made up but I love the way that it sounds made up it's like it's perfect thing story of my birth <laughs> 
So, and this is going to sound made up too, and we can take a little tangent. All right, everyone, buckle up. So okay. my name, my name, my given name is Cassiar, and that was given to me because my parents, when my mom found out she was pregnant, they decided to rent out our house in South Florida and buy an RV and basically drive to Alaska. And so in British Columbia on the Cassiar Highway, my mom went into labor. They made it down to Milwaukee, Oregon, where I was finally born. So that's kind of my, my birth story. And it, people say that sounds made up too, so. <laughs> and I, my first reaction is, can I write a country song about you? <laughs> do you ever collaborate online or do you guys share things that way? Like you go, hey, I recorded this thing in my room or on my phone or something and you share it. Like, do you ever kind of start things that way? I think we've done a couple times where we'll you know, we have like a Facebook group chat and we'll post a recording on there or something, but it's not too often. Okay. We meet tw on a normal week. We'll meet twice a week. Mm -hmm. So if you come up with something on a Tuesday, it'll, you know, just have to wait a couple days before. So yeah, there's not a whole lot that we lose by not doing the online okay. thing. I think by and large, the, we'll get together and sort of, if someone has an idea, they'll say like, here's, here's the progression I came up with or whatever and use the band as a sounding board or help arrange it or st stitch it together with other parts. And then generally it gets taken back and that same person will continue working on it and bring it back the next time. Okay. Yeah. And that's kind of what I'm wondering too. Like, uh, there's, there's a way to, or, or I guess in the downtime, I guess whoever brings the song to the table, is there a way that you would go back and try and rework it? Like you're talking about, like, do you have an example well, of, with our last, th our last song that we wrote is called San Berdu and, the majority of that, uh, I sort of came up with the melody here on my own and brought it to the band and we rearranged the parts and kind of talked about what we would like to do with it. And I had some some lyrics just as substitute for the meantime. I, it's been hard to kind of come up with that sort of aspect of music lately. Yes. So with how busy we've all been. So we, we came up with the music and, you know, we worked on that. And then I think... As a band, a group, we had some ideas of what some of the lines should be, and overall, the the lyrics sort of just formed themselves into conversations, that, past conversations that we had, or just ideas that maybe Tim and I had in passing, and it really just all came together. And then I think, you know, once we wrote it, we played it a couple days later live, and yeah. it, it was fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, that was <laughs> one that once you you basically brought it, and you had all of the parts already written and the melody written. And we kind of just arranged it and figured out how to get our the different instruments. And it was almost entirely ready to go by the end of the time, you know, the day that you showed it to us. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. I like it when that kind of stuff happens. It's yeah. A, where are you booking shows? There's been a lot of change in Madison. Mm -hmm. And some of it is good and some of it's not as good for, you know, artists and musicians that want to get out and maybe make a little bit of money and enjoy what they're doing. But on the other hand, you know, like Boss Meadery is a big uh, mm -hmm. establishment in the mm -hmm. area that's really supportive of, ba supportive of bands. And they were one of the first places in Madison that really like really supported the fantasy pairs and moving forward and playing out live and gave us a space to build up a fan base. And, you know, we've played a couple of shows there within the last few months and they're always packed with yeah. our friends and yeah. people generally really people like, like coming out there. there. Exactly. And Colleen it's, is it's, super cool exactly. and always is like putting, finding ways to make it better. Like they're always yeah. improving their setup. Cause like back, I mean, they were right down the hall from where they are now, but it was like a big giant concrete room. So you put a <laughs> drum set in there and it, it was pretty crazy to try to make sound in that room. But now they've got the new hall. The stage setup is pretty nice. Mm -hmm. And the art in is developing their mm -hmm. space and yeah. They're giving time for bands like us and High Noon even. We've played there several times and they're always really friendly towards us and mm -hmm. make sure that we get great sound while we're there. And it's kind of amazing to think that you have these huge musicians coming through town and they're playing on the same stage as you. It's, right, yeah. it's yeah. you know, that's really neat. Yeah. And that you probably don't find that in a lot of a lot of areas. And I, I do recognize Madison's music scene in contributing to that and coming from North Carolina in a town where I tried to develop a band for several years and was never successful in that. Hmm. Coming to Madison was great. You know, it was the, one of the reasons why I decided to stay here is because I connected with so many artists. And you throw a rock and you'll hit a guitar player. Exactly. <laughs> well, and how do you do that? Because I was looking for a guitar player and I didn't know where to look. Yeah, Open mics. Mic. 
Tim hosted the Ian's open mic for a year. Yeah, I did that for a year, and then Curtis took it over Curtis Goodman, and they finally just ended that. It oh, was, okay. Right. That one was that one's a lot of fun. It was good. <laughs> you get to meet a lot of people that mm-hmm. way. We met so, a lot of local musicians in town just through Ian's open mic. Mm-hmm. It was it was a great medium yeah. for that. It got a slug in the PA every Tuesday. Got a lot of old friends. after yeah. a while. Was a- that was the thing is like once we started the fancy pairs, I was just like I cannot, I can't do both. Mm-hmm. Starting to find myself not writing any more songs and stuff, and always just like playing the same stuff, at old back catalog, if you will, <laughs> at like open mic every Tuesday, and it was well, it was really cool because it was fun to give people a little room to play to because we did like a featured performer thing, uh-huh. and it allowed uh-huh. me to like put the spotlight on certain people sock in human form for example was one i really enjoyed that one like he went over the top and like smashed a guitar and everything <laughs> it was like that was amazing Live and those guys i mean and now kaylin's in parsing and they're you know they opened for maps and atlases the other day so it's cool to be That's part awesome. of that yeah like rain stern when she was just starting out in madison she came in and blew everybody away with with her talent and ability and just so many kids that now i see doing really cool stuff that makes me self-conscious about (laughs) not being productive enough (laughs) like it's great it was really great to be part of it for a while and i do miss it because it forced me to get out some of the places that are hosting music don't have a built-in audience which makes it really difficult for bands when you know your friends are all in bands too you're all playing saturday night there's five shows going on it's like even if you're trying to go and get to everybody's gig you got like three people you're leaving out and just like when i went out to see you guys the other night i missed your actual performance because i had to go over to another (laughs) show so like by the time i showed up your other band was playing so Uh i got to see that but i missed you guys and that was the sole purpose that i came there (laughs) but also and it goes down to the um uh, the problem that I've always had, I never understand when they list the three bands that are playing, which one is in which freaking order. Yeah, I yeah, never understand. Totally like, is the headliner the top one? Is the headliner the bottom one? There's sometimes where we're not sure going the into headliner. a show. <laughs> How do you guys promote yourself? We went into this year thinking that we were going to do a tour and thinking that we were going to get out of Madison, which ultimately didn't happen. As it did happen, we were invited to several pretty cool local festivals and the opportunities just kept coming up here in Madison locally that it didn't give us the time and the space that we needed to get out of Madison. So we made a decision when going into this album, this new album that, you know, next year is our our tour year. We want to get out of Madison, whether that means, you know, a weekend here, there or half a week over, you know, to Nebraska. Omaha is, has a really big uh, hot music scene down south in North Carolina that also I have a lot of friends and family there. So mm-hmm. trying to maybe meet people. I know Aiden has a lot of connections in Florida. So <laughs> just trying to maybe go to the states and areas <laughs> that we can poll people potentially okay. uh, and also maybe get a place to stay for free. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a serious consideration, right? Because, like, especially since we're definitely not making a profit on this, we need to at least not lose too much money just um, trying to go around and play our music out around. Right. Uh, And, you know, we're talking about, you know, putting our next album on vinyl instead of CDs. And we'd like to do new T-shirts. And, you know, we're looking at we have a van for the band that we bought last year, but we're looking at potentially getting a trailer for the van. So there's a lot of expenses that we're willing to commit to to make this a real thing but the money coming in obviously is it's not that that much so what we're doing is just supporting ourselves which is fine but you know it does take a toll on everyday life because you know shit happens like we said (laughs) is most of the income strictly from playing out or do you have streaming income or anything like that we've had a couple investors i guess if if you would want to say the fans of the band that have been supportive really supportive and have asked Um, for nothing really in return a lot of it's coming from us i mean we're doing right now we're at that phase where we're just trying to get people to find out who we are Mm -hmm. we're still a new band so it's like we rely a lot i think on social media and stuff like that we're doing promote a post here or there do interesting videos just try to have something that grabs people's attention that's definitely something i have been trying to figure out forever i still feel like i'm a newbie at that so i mean if you got any ideas shoot them my way (laughs) (laughs) but this past summer with with what we were playing we did make quite a bit of money which i think is why we're thinking about 
you know, spending more money on a trailer and vinyl is because we're at that next step that we, if we take ourselves seriously, then we'll convince others as well, you know, <laughs> regardless <laughs> well, of, a, of what we're playing. But I think there's a very real performance aspect right. of being taken seriously. Exactly. Yeah. And I think yeah. as a band, you know, we've, we've got our groove on stage and now it's time to get our groove as a marketing team almost and, and sell ourselves because i think like all of us are a comfortable horrible. thing exactly. to do especially because we're all pretty introverted like right. uh, will me cassie aiden you're you're a bit more social than us but well what about streaming do you guys offer your stuff on streaming services yeah. or yeah. we just want to get our music out there so okay. we we, we don't try we every, it's paid to play if, if you, you want but you can download it for free also getting people to enjoy what what we're doing is that's i think the main goal was it um cd baby that yeah that so it's on like the itunes and spotify and all yeah, this spotify and then we have Bandcamp too and um, it's, on our, and it's also on our website you can yeah. google the fancy pairs and it will come up uh places that you could listen to and yeah we have a google alert for the fancy pairs and it was like megan markle has removed your tag from the poached pear recipe she was yeah. <laughs> 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 so, no, so we're sneaking our way in yeah, yeah. Well, one, one Meghan Markle recipe at a time. We should put some recipes on the website. It's all great. Actually, that's not a bad idea. That's true. People... When we first started playing out, we used to bring a bowl of pears and pass those out at the beginning yeah, of shows. Sign up for our mailing list yeah. and you will receive a pear right. of fresh produce. But if you realize passing them out at the shows, you're giving people fruit at a live event. Yeah, and what, in hi. Yeah, in history, people don't do good things with that. There. What is your favorite platform? I mean, do you or which one do you find more effective? Uh, doing putting your stuff on Facebook. I know you guys have a Tumblr and Instagram, uh, YouTube channel. Plus, there's SoundCloud, Bandcamp. Like, which one do you find is not only the one that seems to be the most responsive, but which one do you actually use? I think generally, it's it's Facebook and Instagram for the most part. We have friends on both and bands that we follow on both. So. Honestly, those are probably the top two mediums that we My use. My personal and... favorite is Bandcamp, but I yeah. think people get yeah. most excited about Spotify. Like, I like Bandcamp because, like, I don't know, you have control over how your page looks and all this, and it's, like, nice and organized, and I like that to some extent. I feel like the question I most frequently get asked is, are you guys on Spotify? And yeah. that is, yeah. the answer is luckily yes. So, I think as a listener, just a generic whatever, when I'm at work, I'll throw on Spotify and I'll, you know, put a song or two in a playlist and let it figure out what sounds like it. And that's really nice. And I think that's good to have the content on there. But personally, as a musician and as a pseudo business type musician person, Bandcamp is nice. Because mm -hmm. if somebody does want to do the pay what you want thing, they could throw $15 at the band for an album. Versus they can listen all day, every day on Spotify and will get 15 cents. That's, I think, effective marketing. See, I have a love-hate relationship with Spot or with Bandcamp. Yeah, it's, it's well... Okay. One reason is because it's one of the few platforms that doesn't give you monetization for streaming. Their API is open. People can build apps based on the library on Bandcamp and monetize the stuff their way and use your music because it's on Bandcamp. And I don't like that. Spotify, people listen to it and you get paid even if it's a fraction of a penny. Hey, it's more than yeah. you would anywhere else. That's why I love and hate it, but it's a cart and it's a cart that's set up to do like what you were saying. So it's very handy. But at the same time, too, it's not something you would go search for for music. That's why Spotify yeah. seems to be a good way to do it. I get inordinately excited when our songs come up in my playlists. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm like, yeah, we did it. And it's like, oh, it's like, we put that on there ourselves. But still, yeah. it's a joy. I don't know. I like it. I mean, I, I know exactly what you mean about the love-hate thing because I find a lot of music through Spotify. Mm -hmm. It's not like I, yeah. as you can see, we buy lots of physical music, too. You're in yeah. a room surrounded with vinyl. It helps me be like, well, what do I need? for my collection you know and then like <laughs> no that's a really or new I think it's an important thing you know, it's 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 always exciting it's to find new music, people have yeah. now to be able to try stuff on for size too yeah, I feel like yeah. that's just kind of the way I think it's a totally reasonable are, expectation yeah, I wouldn't like, want to buy $25 worth of vinyl and end up hating it but that's a bummer but as a band I don't think that that's our focus mm -hmm. but, right. you know all of our stuff online has kind of been put up there as yeah. sort of an afterthought trying to work through something and create an online presence with no time when really we just want to focus on the music anyway 
but it has been we've realized that there is a, a place for that and people need that to to learn learn who you are and learn more about you so and that's really the whole point of it right because if you're talking about instagram and facebook mm -hmm. we can regardless of where you host the music you can tell the people who already like you and know you mm -hmm. hey there's new music go check it out and they will but if somebody's trying to listen from somewhere else in the world mm -hmm. and discover you, that's they're not going to search for fancy pairs on facebook and find out where you're posting the new new stuff they're just going to stumble on it on spotify or wherever ultimately you want to have your music everywhere because you don't want to just like i thought it was funny when taylor swift was like i'm taking my stuff off of spotify great now half of your fans who love spotify are gonna be like i can't listen to her music anymore well she can get away with that right she, <laughs> she can but but the thing is is she's really punishing her fans because that's where they listen to music and they're like well i paid to have that album and they just took it off of spotify and now i can't listen to it and it comes down to if yeah. you don't have a physical it's sort of a weird time for music right now and you know maybe i'm oversimplifying things from just a point of being naive on it and new to this industry but in general it, it does seem that music is more of a commodity these days instead mm -hmm. of being treasured as an art form as as i believe it should be it's almost expected you're, you're not hired entertainment you're just here to entertain it's like the allison cross song you're like, you're going to yeah. do it anyway, even if it doesn't pay. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. I was literally going to give you that answer. Right, yeah. And that's, you know, we just saw Courtney Bar Barnett a couple weeks ago, and she she covered that song, and it was yeah, great. Awesome. Cool, cool yeah. Version. yeah. So I feel like with all of that, too, it's kind of like going back to what Cassie said, is it's such like an afterthought. Because, I mean, I feel like I'm like a baby with that stuff. Like, I know I've been playing. I know I've been, I've been playing in bands for what feels like forever. I have never had a sense of how to do that. And I mean, it's a very opaque thing. I was like, well, if we just keep playing somehow, someone, <laughs> like, if we just keep playing out a million shows, eventually there will be some, some someone who wants to manage our band or someone who wants to, like, some AR guy will be somewhere. And that is not how any of that works. And but like, that's how it happens in every movie that I've right. seen. Right. And, yeah. like, but that's literally what you have to go off of. And, I mean, I started doing this when I was, like, 18, 19, you know, playing in coffee houses, then actually getting out in a band when I'm 20. And, and our first show, I don't think I was even 21 yet at a bar and uh that was what you knew how to do like my dad was a musician and that's what he did so mm -hmm. that's what i thought i would do that's just not where people are now like i don't want to go hang out in a fucking bar all the time mm -hmm. to be honest with you like i only go to bars when i play music now or when you go to see a show yeah, right like, yeah like or go to see a show exactly mm -hmm. like some of my favorite shows ever were playing in someone's living room there was a place called the dollhouse diy in chicago for a while that was cool it did a oh. couple shows there i kind of feel like that is where a lot of people are really gravitating <laughs> towards and it's kind of a pain for music as a whole it's kind of de it's like depriving us of full bands because like if you're like really devoted and you're really serious you really want to do this this is what i want to do with my life this is the only choice i have your best choice right now with how stuff is kind of feels like just getting in the car by yourself putting together a decent solo set mm -hmm. and then you know even if you're only making 20 25 bucks a night it's still like if you're the only one who's playing it's not so bad it fills the gas tank gets you on to the next next gig and you can play in a living room you can play in a non-traditional venue like that and i feel like that's where a lot of stuff is going or where a lot of the people who are like really devoted music fans are going but how would you find those like mm -hmm. that yeah. i've always found them through friends who were yeah. playing my buddy joe who was our bass player my bass player from 10 years ago is now out doing his own mm -hmm. thing old wolves amazing music and yeah, he's yeah. really been playing like really hitting it hard so anytime i need to know Ooh. where i <laughs> so even you know, even finding them as a friend of a friend yeah well, and, well, and, and and because it's people's houses it's yeah. literally just they're throwing right. together a show in their basement and, and if you're their friend the or and, you heard about it yeah right. and there are also pages on facebook too where you can ask to be to join and then they'll people will throw out messages like hey right. i have this space in yeah. chicago i need a band to fill it for this mm -hmm. date and that's also a great tool to use too. Get We've, on the booking Bible. Right. Like We've, definitely get on that because we get hit up by so many bands because yeah, being really. on the Madison booking We've Bible had a lot for of real. People yeah, come reach actually... out to us to play because of Facebook or because the booking Bible or because of these, yeah. you know, databases of Madison musicians and what kind of music they play. They're they're great tools. Literally just put your name everywhere. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. right. If you'd like to check out The Fancy Pairs, you can go to their website at thefancypairs.com. And if you haven't already, you can subscribe to this podcast at lorenzosmusic.com. 
Next week, I talk to a band called Audio Farm. I'll talk to you later. <laughs>